So my name is Elizabeth Gowing and I was born in Britain in a town called Ely, which is in Cambridgeshire in the east of, of England. Um, and we were there because of my father's job. He was a, a worked in the Air Force and so all of my childhood we moved around from place to place. So we didn't stay very long in, in Ely. And in fact, uh, his father was also in the Air Force and my mother's father was also in the Air Force for a short time. So it's very difficult when people in Kosovo ask me where I'm from, because I'm not really from anywhere. I don't have even from my father or from my grandfather a place where, you know, it's really ours. So, I mean, I'm happy with that, but it makes that conversation com complicated. So we only lived in Ely for, I think I was one when we moved from there. And then we moved back to Cambridgeshire a few more times during my childhood, but. I don't feel like I'm from Cambridgeshire, but I happen to be born there. <laughs> How do you remember your childhood, like in this movement, constant movement? How? Yeah, it didn't feel like it was a constant movement. <laughs> um, like it felt, I think my mother is very good at, very adaptable and very good at making a home and making things feel, you know, safe. And it didn't feel like a complicated way to live. And in fact, it, I think it helps with my strange life now because now I live in three places. I have three homes and I, in an average month, I spend maybe um, two weekends, three weekends in Kosovo. So I'm here maybe nine days a, a month. And then I'm in Albania for uh, the rest of the time, except one week I'm in England. So that's my average month is split into three pieces. So I think maybe... The idea of being on the move or of making a home wherever you are, perhaps that came from having moved around a lot as a child. Um, and I was the, uh, there's two of us, me and my sister, but I was the first one to be born. And I was uh, five when my sister was born. So actually I was an only child for a lot of my childhood. Um, and then uh, when I was nine, uh, I was sent to boarding school um, because of my father being in the Air Force and because of the moving around. So they, it's normal for children whose parents are in the forces to go to boarding school. And that was okay. I didn't love going to boarding school, but I think I, it gave me lots of opportunities. You know, it was a very good school and it gave me lots of academic opportunities, but also social opportunities. Like I, the Air Force pays a, a contribution to, to schooling. And I also won a scholarship to the school. And so my family was one of the poorest families in the school. I mean, we weren't poor, but compared to the others, they were very much more rich kind of elite children, girls. It was an all girls school. And so I think this gave me um, at first I found it hard because they all had very beautiful clothes and uh, things mattered very much. This was 1980s Britain, like Margaret Thatcher's Britain. And so this idea of having the right labels in your clothes mattered a lot. And that was a big shock for me because my family is not like that. But I think that I learned from that, like just not to care. And I think it gave me a confidence once I had got used to it. I, it gave me a confidence like to be with rich people or very privileged people and not to feel uh, to feel confident in saying like, this is not my world, and, but I'm not going to compete with you. I, I don't need to have the right labels on my clothes. There are other things that are more important. So I'm, I'm grateful for having had that experience because I think otherwise I might have spent my life always thinking that there are rich people or elite people or who uh, is a world that I can't uh, be part of. And I've kind of seen that world now and I feel comfortable in, in ignoring it. <laughs> Where was this? Like, uh, so the school is in Malvern, which is in, um, it's in the centre of England. It's a very beautiful little town, but it's a very strange town. Um, in the 19th century, it was very famous because of the water there. The water was supposed to be very good for your health. So it was like a spa town. And so people would come to the spa town to take the water for their health. So there were lots of big houses built there, Victorian houses. And they're too big now for a normal family to live in. And so most of them have been turned into either old people's homes um, or like nursing homes or boarding schools. So when I was there, there were five boarding schools and only one government state school. And of the five boarding schools, four of them were girls schools and one was all boys. 
So it's a very weird way to grow up. <laughs> yeah. It's not a normal, exactly, not a normal demographic. Either very old people, yeah. they were very rich people, and more girls, four times more girls than boys. So I had a very strange <laughs> adolescence. Um, How and, is Uh, yeah, there wasn't really intergenerational connection. I wish there had been, but uh, the schools, maybe they're different now, but the schools were very um, self-contained and they didn't encourage connections really with other schools or with the local community. Or I, I guess maybe they were worried about keeping people safe, but I think we missed opportunities for because we could, for example, have gone to see the old people's homes. Uh, I remember we did have like some a volunteering program where we would go to we would cook lunch and then invite some of the older people to have lunch i remember doing that a few times and then when i was uh, in sixth form so like in the middle school part of the school i uh, there was a, a big volunteering initiative and i spent some time in a, a, a shelter for women who had survived domestic violence and, and that was i mean that felt very like connecting with the real life and the real community and so I'm glad that our school had that opportunity. I think that's an opportunity that in Kosovo is still quite rare for people, for students to be encouraged to make connections like that. So I think once I got to that age, the older, the last two years in the school, then I had opportunities to be more of the person I wanted to be. I started the um, Amnesty International group at the school and I was the representative for volunteering and you know, that's when I started doing some of the things that I still do now. So. What kind of education was it? Was it more like liberal arts or...? Um, it was quite an academic school so um, it, it was quite tough I suppose on uh, quite rigorous for for learning academically but there were also good opportunities for drama you know I, I acted in plays and doing public speaking which is something I do a lot of now I'm glad I had that training in public speaking um, and even things like fencing you know like fencing with a, you know I don't know how to say that in Albanian that's you know not many schools offer fencing but I learned to fence I, I had a term of learning golf so you know great opportunities that you wouldn't have in a normal government school and I guess that's what comes of going to a, a privileged school I did have lots of opportunities It was. I, I think we kept very close. It, uh, people think it must be very strange. I mean, even in England, people think it's strange, and certainly in Kosovo, like the idea of not being with your family. And I know my parents found it very hard. They didn't. They didn't want to send me away. But we, you know, we wrote letters a lot. Cause it was before <laughs> all the other forms of communication, and um, I, they came to visit maybe every every three weeks or every month. Either I'd, they'd come or I would have the chance to go home for one or two nights. I mean, it seems strange to talk about now. but And then, of course, when I went home for the holidays, it was a really special time, you know, it was because it was just free time and quality time. And um, so I never had to argue with my parents about homework or, you know, about sharing the bathroom, <laughs> like the routines of a normal family life, because when I was home, it was all like a treat for everybody. So, so it was very happy. Growing up, yeah. Were they moving within England or throughout Europe? Yeah, throughout. Uh, even they lived in uh, Belgium. Um, we lived in Germany when I was a young child before I went to boarding school. But Belgium and Algeria. Um, so those were the two foreign countries during my time in school. And then they also lived in London for a time. So, yeah, so I got to explore the world a bit as well in my holidays. <laughs> So I applied to Oxford University and um, I was accepted, but I had a, a gap year, you know, a year where I did a lot of traveling. I, I went to India and I went to Egypt and North Africa and um, I did a lot of volunteering, um, working with the homeless and and I also did a lot of jobs. I, I um, worked as a secretary, I worked as a cleaner, I worked in a restaurant I, to save the money to do the traveling. So that was a a good year of, you know, trying out, becoming an adult. Can you and describe us one of the places that you, like, 
Yeah, it's a good question. Because it's difficult when you go from one context to the other. Yeah, I suppose the volunteering, like working for this charity which worked for the homeless, so going and giving food to people who are sleeping on the streets and talking to them about, often they survived by going through the rubbish and pick, looking for food in the bins, this is in London. Um, so that, you know, I'd lived in London then for maybe four years and I thought I knew the city, but this was an, another side to the city and it made me realise, you know, the realities of a city always has this underbelly of people who are, maybe there are drug issues or there are mental health problems or reasons why they're not with their families or in a home, but the, then how vulnerable they are. So I suppose you can make a connection between that and then what I find myself doing in, in Kosovo. Um, How was England at that time? You mentioned uh, Pasha being uh, in power. Yeah, she, in fact, she lost power during that year. Um, so um, how was England? Well, I think England wasn't a very kind place during Thatcher's Britain. And growing up in a private school, a private boarding school, probably didn't... Um, I wasn't open to being connected with the whole of my country. You know, the miners' strike, for example, which was this, you know, a very big event in the history and the identity of Britain today, that happened while I was at that school and I scarcely noticed that it happened. You know, this was just felt like a long way away. It didn't touch my world of privilege. And I feel embarrassed about that now because if there was a miners' strike now and the way that divided the country and the then I would want to be engaged and I would want, if I had a daughter, I would want her to be engaged. But I was shut away in, in this bubble of private boarding school. So I, I think I probably didn't know what Britain was like. And that's why my gap year was so important that I had that chance to find out some realities. Uh, did you visit all these places that you mentioned throughout that single year? Yeah, so I, yeah, I did a lot of traveling. I had originally had a plan to travel with one on a bus, um, like a group of people to go on a bus from England down through Europe and then across Iran and oh, into North Africa and then across Iran and then go all the way to India. And then I changed my mind and decided I would make individual trips myself rather than doing it with one group of people. So I organized lots of different trips, which was good because it meant I could, um, I could work for a bit, travel for a bit, work for a bit, travel for a bit. So. So, yeah, was it I, a common thing at the time to go to India as a British? I mean, I didn't yes, know yeah, there were lots of people, time. exactly. Um, uh, and it was a, it's a place that you know, speaks English, lots of people speak English. It's a familiar place in the British identity because, it, as you say, it was one of our colonies, and so part of our empire anyway. So, yeah, there were lots of backpackers when I, when I was there. But it was still a really wonderful experience. Um, of course, you, if you go to places for a short time, you don't get to really understand them or get under the skin. But just traveling on your own was very exhilarating. To, um, I remember when I got, went to India, I was going to travel with a group of people, but I arrived one day early. And so I um, got there and had a day just all on my own in, in Delhi. I was 17 then, so it was <laughs> it's quite scary to think about. And... Um, was I 17? Yeah, 17. And uh, I didn't know like what to do. I was just walking around just wide eyed and looking. And uh, I sat down in this park and a guy came up to me and he offered to clean my ears with these tools like this metal, like a scoop and a long stick. <laughs> and uh, I just remember thinking, you know, yeah, I'll have this experience. And now I think about it like I let a guy I'd never met stick a metal stick in my ear and clean my ears, you know, in public. <laughs> but that was, you know, having an experience <laughs> that hadn't happened in my private boarding school <laughs> in the middle of England. So, yeah, it was exciting. What did you do next? Like, how, how did this experience inform the next? Uh, so then I went to, to Oxford and I uh, was studying English literature and, and Oxford is a, a wonderful place. Oxford University is a, a university with just so many opportunities. So I was very lucky and very, uh, I think I, I took lots of opportunities. I did lots of things. I got involved in, 
in the environmental society. I got involved as a volunteer with um, a charity that worked with people who had AIDS. Um, I worked um, te as a teacher, a volunteer teacher for newly arrived immigrants to, to England. So I did a lot of volunteering there, but I also did lots of drama. I, I um, directed a play. Um, I in fact a couple of plays I directed and um, you know went to lots of talks and lectures and not just for my studies but about all kinds of things and uh, yeah I met people like who were different from from me and so it's a very very rich place of experiences to go but probably most importantly is where I met Rob who is my my partner so we've been together for 25 years and I met him there on my first year of university so we've been together ever since so that was probably the most precious thing I took <laughs> from Oxford. <laughs> and did it feel as another bubble? Like, I mean, just in terms of privilege? Uh-huh. I don't think it did feel like that. And that might be, it, I, maybe it should have felt like a bubble because it is a very privileged place. Um, but I, I think because I was active with people who weren't just from the university, things like working with this family who'd just arrived from Africa, um, as a teacher, a home tutor for their children, or working with people who had AIDS, or you know, I felt like I was uh, connecting with a world that wasn't just the world of privilege. Um, so, I, I think, and I think that's one of the strengths of of Oxford and of, of other universities in Britain is that they work quite hard to offer opportunities. So, of course, people can go and live in this elite world, and that's what some people want from Oxford, but. If you bring that many thousands of intelligent people together, then you, you're going to find people who also want to do something with their ideas. And, and I guess that's what it gave me, the opportunity to, to see how people might do that and what could be achieved and challenging the way I thought about the world. And, you know. and how did you meet Rob at Oxford? Just at a party. Uh, he, he did a lot of acting then. He'd been in a play and it was a party... Um, it was a friend of ours' party, but he'd just come on from a, the, the end of play party. And he, yeah, we just got talking and he walked me home and kissed me. <laughs> it happened very quickly. <laughs> so, yeah, we, I think we would have met eventually. We had a lot of friends in common. We had a lot of interests in common. You know, it, it's not like one of those freak meetings that you might think uh, uh, if, you know, per pack we missed each other but no we we were meant to be together in lots of practical ways as well as very significant ways how long did you stay there or how at oxford uh, so three-year course and then i decided i wanted to be a teacher and so i had to go to do an extra year of teacher training and so i needed to raise the money i wanted to fund myself for that and so i spent another year in oxford um, not at the university but living in oxford and working to earn the money to pay to become a teacher. So I, um, I worked then at a special school, a school for children with special needs, as an assistant at the school. But I also worked in a bar and I also worked cleaning and, you know, I did lots of jobs to try to... I also worked at the um, Oxford University Press, the, the publishing house. So just doing whatever I could to earn money so that I could uh, pay for the next year of living in London and training to be a teacher. And that was a year, you said, right? That was a year, yeah, exactly. So. Did, you, did you really start teaching afterwards or did you any yeah. start with any practical...? So, well, I, I'd been working as this assistant in the school anyway, and then I went to the, um, to the teacher college, and you have to do a lot of practical work there mm -hmm. as well. And then I... Um, got a job straight away in London and started teaching really in you know really full on teaching in a London school with a lot of difficulties and um, that was but that, that was great I had so much energy for it and you know I loved it and it was exhausting but it was uh, that really felt like what I wanted to be doing with my life so Uh, so it was 96 that I trained, that I got my um, certificate and then I, yeah, that's right, 96, and, yeah, and then I uh, worked in various different schools and um, also did some management roles in schools. So I was the, um, I took the role of the deputy head in, in a school and 
then I, after that, decided not to teach full time, but to do some uh, policy work. So I worked in education, but advising the government and working in a teacher's professional organisation. And I continued teaching after that just part time because I wanted to still have some connection with children and the classroom. But so I uh, did one day a week of, of teaching. And that's what I was doing. For, so I did that for 10 years. And then basically one day Rob said, do you realize that there's nothing to stop us just doing exactly what we're doing right now for the rest of our lives? And although we were happy, it wasn't like we weren't happy with our jobs and with London and with each other. We wanted a, a change, you know, and we decided we didn't want to have children. And so our friends were all starting to have children. And I could see that we were going to just be doing same old, same old, same old. And we decided to go a, a, abroad and we wanted to volunteer. So we sent off our CVs to lots of charities in Africa and Asia. And, uh, we thought maybe we'd do a year of, of volunteering. But at the same time, uh, Rob had been working with the British government. And so he um, uh, sent an email out to people he knew in the embassies around where he had contacts to say, if you hear of any NGO that might want some volunteers, Elizabeth and I are looking to volunteer. And then the embassy in Kosovo got back in contact and said, well, we don't know about a volunteering job, but we think that the new Kosovan prime minister wants a British advisor and we think that you could do this job. So Rob came home one day and said, you know, how about uh, going to Kosovo for six months? That was 11 years ago. <laughs> he said it was for six months. And like, to be honest, Kosovo was too near. That wasn't really what we were. We had been wanting to go further and somewhere that seemed exotic and very different. But it was like, OK, we hadn't had any answers from the volunteering applications we'd done. This was a very safe way to do it, it felt, because it was paid. So it wasn't like we were having to give up everything. And it was only six months <laughs> is what we thought. So we said... Yeah, let's do it. And it moved really quickly. So 10 days after he was offered the job, our house was packed up. And 10 days after that, we were here. So it was That's not quite how we planned. <laughs> yeah. how, how is it? How was your, well, what are your first impressions? What were? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, very good ones. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have stayed. Um, I mean, it wasn't how I imagined it was going to be. I think everyone's surprised by Kosovo, everyone who comes from, from Britain, because the images that you have of Kosovo, the only information you have is about the war and about refugees, maybe about corruption. Or, so you come expecting a country that's um, going to be physically damaged from the war, particularly in 2006 is when we came. So it was, you know, seven years had passed. And I thought I would see buildings that had bullet holes in them and um, and... I guess I was suspicious of people, you know, I was expecting people to be dishonest or not trustworthy. Or, and I remember like on the very first day at the hotel, just somebody offering to help us and me thinking, hmm, this doesn't seem like someone who's untrustworthy. You know, if, if someone's being so welcoming and so hospitable and so helpful and thinking, oh, I, maybe I need to shift my what I'm expecting of this country. And, you know, every person I met here shifted that a little bit more, like, you know, you had the wrong idea. And the war wasn't very obvious, you know, there weren't houses with bullet holes in them. And this, of course, it's still a part of people's identity and experience, but it's not part of the physical landscape, not in 2006 and not now even less. So all of that was a surprise to that it was a... A different kind of country but I remember on that very first day we were at the hotel and Rob went off to his to meet the Prime Minister Agim Cheku and I was left in the hotel like not knowing what I was going to do and I remember looking out of the window at the hotel it was the Hotel Batsi um, which is shut now but uh, there's a block of building of shops and buildings opposite and I just was looking out at this apartment opposite thinking like who lives there and what's their life like? Who are these people? You know, I want to get to know the reality of the life here. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that I, we were welcomed into people's lives to be able to do that. That, it, uh, that first Friday, so we arrived on a, on a Monday, I think. And that Friday we were taken out to dinner by 
a Kosovan couple who Rob was working with, I think probably the next week we were invited to our first Kosovan home. Like within three weeks, we had gone to our first wedding. <laughs> like people invite you in very quickly. So I, yeah. Where did you move in? Where? Where was your first house here? Um, in Pristina, yeah. Um, the first wedding was in, in Podjeva, in Lupši Poštum, in the village <laughs> in Podjeva. It was a proper Kosovan village wedding, you know, beautiful, lots of dancing, everybody in traditional clothes, and, uh, and that was that? great. That yeah, well, that was great. It was um, a family who I had actually met in London when I'd been teaching in London in 1999. Um, a Kosovan family came to our school. And uh, I'd helped, the, I had some children, in, one of the children in my class, and I, so I'd helped them settle a, a bit. And I kept in touch with that family after, even after the children left the school. And uh, so when they heard that I was coming here, you know, they were amazed. That, and I was amazed that I had a connection. And so they very kindly put me in touch with their aunt who lived here, who I'm still in touch with, Elma Zepireva, who bizarrely is now in London. <laughs> so we've kind of switched. And uh, their uncle was getting married, and so they invited me to the wedding. And I hadn't realised until I arrived, but I was kind of, well, I was treated at least like the guest of honour. You know, I was really, I was put in the car with the, the groom's sister. And uh, when, we, when it was the Kanadjech, I was invited to dance, <laughs> like the first to dance, on my own. And so you know, I had to stand up, you know, put my hands in the air, kind of wiggle. It was, um, that was quite frightening, but very, of course, very welcoming. In which part of the city did you move in? Uh, so we lived then by the old Ministry of Education, which is... Uh, behind the old Benaf, <laughs> there's a very Pristina way to give directions, um, by, um, I, I don't know actually how, it's kind of near Ulpiana, like opposite Ulpiana. Anyway, it was a very nice house in the, with a little garden and um, we were very lucky. The, the house was paid for by the British government, so it was nicer than we'd been living in in, in London and nicer than what we live in now, <laughs> but it was, um, it, it felt, like a very happy place making a home and it was empty when we when we uh, moved in no furniture at all and we had no furniture or very few bits of furniture so actually that was a great way to discover Kosovo because I had to go and I learned the word for garnishta for, you know I learned the, I had to go and find a carpenter zrugstari was my like one of my first words which is a really difficult word and uh, he made some tables and you know shelves for us and I like we really made everything from from the beginning and uh, that was my project because I didn't have any work and so that's how I learned Albanian as well I mean I had lessons but this is how I practiced Albanian and you don't normally learn Ganishta and Zruksar <laughs> in your first lessons <laughs> Did you learn it here or yeah you yeah 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 oh, no okay. well because we only had like three weeks before coming yeah, here yeah. so Rob had a few lessons in England and he passed a few words to me but you know, with three weeks just to get ready, like we didn't have time to, to, to really be ready. So luckily we had a great teacher, Ghazi Berlayoli, who worked with us like one-to-one -one and, uh, and that was really exciting as well as a way of learning about the new place. And how long did you learn it or how was that? Well, I'm still learning it. <laughs> uh, I remember I'd been here a year. I did some work for Save the Children for, for a long time. I worked as a consultant for Save the Children. And um, in the, the summer after we had arrived, uh, I did some training for teachers for Save the Children. And they offered me a translator, as I'd always had before. And I said, you know, I, I need a translator, yes. Like, I'm not obviously fluent, but the translator always slows things down. You know, you have to say everything twice. And sometimes the translator doesn't quite get it right what, what you want to say and I think I'm at the stage where it's the disadvantages of having a translator outweigh the advantages like I can do it and of course I will make mistakes but you know we'll, we'll work it through and that felt like a very big day to be able to go and do training without a translator so that day I felt like I had learnt to speak Albanian of course not fluently but enough um, but yeah, I really am still learning. I have a notebook. I write down words, new words every day. You know, it's 